census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Watching Anthony Hopkins act is like watching a master at work. The way he conveys so many different emotions in his performances continues to captivate me. If you regularly watch video essay content like this, you may have seen the Nerd Rider's superb essay on what makes Hopkins great in the show Westworld, or Every Frame of Painting's short but sweet essay on winning the scene within Silence of the Lambs. We're going to talk about both today, using an element that I feel many writers often underestimate but should be as important as any other element, and that is how The Silence of the Lambs finds strength within its compelling subplot featuring one of my all-time favourite characters, Dr. Hannibal Lecter. In John Truby's book The Anatomy of Story, he had this to say, the subplot character is one of the most misunderstood in fiction. Most writers think of the character as the lead in a second story, which isn't necessarily true. The subplot character has a precise function in a story, and again it involves the comparative method. The subplot is used to contrast how the hero and a second character deal with the same problem in slightly different ways. Through comparison, the subplot character highlights traits and dilemmas of the main character. In The Silence of the Lambs, our hero is FBI trainee Clarice Starling, who is tasked with the objective of catching a serial killer named Buffalo Bill. Her boss, Jack, suggests that she seek the help of another incarcerated serial killer, the psychopathic cannibal, Dr. Hannibal Lecter. Good morning. It's worth noting that in the book and film adaptation, there are key differences between how we first learn about Lecter. In the book, he is described as a sociopath, whereas in the movie, he is described as a psychopath. And I think that's an intentional choice. He displays various psychopathic traits in his introductory scene, like narcissism, a superficial charm, a lack of empathy for his past victims, and emotional manipulation of Chloe Starling to get what he wants. However, it appears Dr. Lecter in the movie seems to genuinely care for Chloe Starling. He does this in their first meeting by pointing out various mistakes she makes, like her ID having a week left, or how she ham-handedly segues into what she really wants from him. Lecter humors her for this whole scene, essentially seeing Starling not as another agent, but perhaps as one of his patients, and he uses his skill as a psychiatrist to help her overcome her own troubles throughout the movie. This can be seen by the fact that he begins with calling her by her last name in their first meeting, but gradually over the movie begins to use her first name, indicating a growing relationship between the two. In their second meeting, she asks Lecter if he knows who the latest victim is, and instead, Lecter responds with a question, noting that she should be asking about Buffalo Bill. This shows both a lack of empathy for the victim, but a desire to see Starling become better. Lecter being a former psychiatrist must relish in the idea that he is helping catch a killer who he may see as less capable than him. It's here we also learn what Lecter really wants. He's accepted his situation that he will never be a free man again, but he colours this whilst telling Clarice that he just wishes to be able to see simple things like a tree or water, elements of things that free people may take for granted in his mind. He relishes in the game of not giving Clarice Starling direct answers but highlighting the path for which she can discover them on her own. All good things to those who wait. We also come to understand that Clarice Starling isn't perfect herself. We later learn when she confides in Dr. Lecter about her father's murder in the line of duty. He gives her a place where she can be open without feeling like she's being judged. But through this, she begins to respect Lecter a bit more despite his dangerous actions. When Clarice Starling tells him about how she used to wake up to the sounds of lambs being slaughtered after being relocated to a relative's house following her father's murder, we see how this had a negative effect on her childhood. Starling is someone who was surrounded by death and suffering, and thus tries to overcome this by becoming the best agent she can be. But she does this by confiding in the least likely person to help her in the scenario. It's a beautiful and somewhat tragic message that because of Lecter, she learns to become a better agent. She learns it from someone who she should despise, which causes her character to grow and change within the story. Lecter points out that her main motivation to rescue Buffalo Bill's latest victim will help her deal with the nightmares of the lamb's screams. By catching him, it will result in the silence of the lambs. All three main characters want something in the movie. Lecter wants to be free from his chains, 
Starling wants to be the best agent that she can be, and Buffalo Bill wants to strip away all parts of his past identity. We do learn a lot about Lecter and his limited screen time within the movie, but every scene he's in we cannot take our eyes off him, and this is where the film shines. Once Lecter gets the chance, we see his terrifying nature as he brutally slaughters the guards, even wearing one of their faces as a method to escape custody. When we first see him here, he's wearing the iconic mask and he's being treated far differently than his interactions with Starling. He's almost like a caged animal, and once he's unleashed, we then witness his vicious nature as a killer, rather than him telling us about it. The scene is later paid off at the ending where Clarice Starling receives a call from Dr. Lecter at her graduation. He congratulates her and says he hopes that she can return the favour for his assistance in helping her achieve her goals. Starling of course says she can't do this, which Lecter understands and then comments that he's having a friend for dinner before disappearing into the crowd. Clarice Starling has gotten what she wanted at a cost and so has Hannibal Lecter. She gets to become an agent despite playing a part in the dangerous criminal getting away, and Lecter becomes a free man, but loses the relationship he formed with Starling over the course of the movie. Both characters achieve their goals, and this subplot allows them to deal with their struggles and problems in different ways by the end. What I believe we can learn from this is that a subplot isn't just something you should throw into a story to make it more realistic or to have more going on within the main plot. A subplot should complement your story, not distract from it, and that's what makes Silence of the Lambs so excellent. We get to witness a character overcome their struggles and achieve their goals, but at the cost of letting Lecter slip through her fingers. Agent Clarice Starling becomes a stronger character through essentially confiding in and making a deal with the devil. Silence of the Lambs shows us that a subplot shouldn't distract the audience, but engage them even further, like any tool to tell a story. The devil is in the details. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Doing these essays has brought some more traffic to my channel and I cannot wait to do more. I ran a fan poll this week to decide which film I should do an essay on next and you guys picked Sing Street. But I also saw a lot of love for Mean Girls in the comments. So surprise, you're getting both. Thanks again for watching and if you like this video, hit the subscribe button and I will see you guys next time.